drop off or pick up period. Hey, John. John. Yeah, yeah I've had a conversation or email conversation back with Dana about it. I have some of the neighbors in our area here um, had reached out to me and saying what's going on down at Holcomb Middle um, Elementary School. And I go, what's going on? And the street is being blocked uh, by, especially around the 2 to 2.30, people trying to turn in. So they're blocking both east and westbound traffic on Holcomb, and there's no way to get around it. Um, and people are just lining up all the way up down the hill or up the hill um, getting in there. So I asked her if there's a possibility that we could reach out to the school and come up with uh, some kind of a system so they can get the cars from quit blocking the road. Um, and it's right there at that turn, if you're familiar with it, where it's kind of the blind turn and then boom, you know. And now that that big tree is gone, the one that died from the ice storm, I don't know if there's any way they could maybe expand into that and make a tur middle turn lane in there to try to get um, that a, a safer turn into the school there. Um, she mentioned that conversation. Um, you know, I mean, Holcomb Boulevard is, uh, that's a, that's a, that corner there um, is, Mess. Well, it is what it is, right? It's it's got um, some geometry there that uh, you know. Obviously, you wouldn't want to design today, let alone put a school driveway access point right in it. But um, I think uh, you know the idea of adding a center turn lane on Mall Avenue. I mean, on uh, Holcomb Avenue, we're seeing that proposal for a new subdivision up there too, taking some of the on street parking up the hill from there and wide, you know, widening that the lanes out, pushing the lanes out so that the center turn lane could happen. That's in a pretty straight section of roadway. Um, in that corner there, you know, there's just no way for that to uh, happen without, um, you know, quite a geometric design. And we'd spend, I don't know, lots of money on that kind of project, but um so, I, you know, I think it's back to trying to work with the school district to kind of get a handle on better options for drop-offs. We talked to them about there is, a, you know, a neighborhood drop-off location that folks could go to as opposed to using Holcomb, you know, again, staggering their drop-off times, those kind of things. But trying to, you know, for, well, one, I would say, we're already having conversations about how to reprioritize projects in our transportation system plan. There is no plan for a center turn lane in our transportation system plan for Holcomb Boulevard. And so, you know, if, if there was a community interest in making Holcomb a three lane facility, um, whether it be just at certain locations or at the entire length, that's a pretty big project. And we'd want to, we'd want to go through a, of process to get in something like that amended to a transportation system plan. So the proposal there's that um, in the planning commission to build, I think 130 homes just, uh, just to the east of the school there on that lot. And they've already cleared it. And now they're just waiting, you know, to start pushing dirt around, I guess. I wonder if there's any um, requirements in there to um, alleviate that, you know, for the school because it's not that far. It's pretty close down the hill there. And you're going to have another 130 cars, you know, going down there, maybe 260, you know, a day. Um, and it's still like the Oregon Trail, that road. It's not a smooth road, you know, going down it. So plus then they have that other development of the 450 that they're looking at on the other side. So there's going to need to be, I think, our group dealing with the planning commission and like, okay, we're going to permit all these homes to be built. How, what are you going to do for this road? Because it can't handle all that the way it's set up right now. Well, Tim, I'd like to interject something there on that. Um, <clears throat> you, you will not get any objections from the school district in regard to whether it produces more traffic or not, because those developments mean money for the school district. Correct. And they're not about to do anything or say anything 
to delay or eliminate further um, development. I know exactly what you're talking about. I know exactly what John was talking about on the backups on Holcomb because I live there on Oak Tree Terrace. And uh, it's, it's a bad situation there on Holcomb. John, I got a question on this one. It's been, this discussion's kind of been churning my mind a little bit. Is the county housing authority still trying to get rid of their housing up there? Yes, they're in the process. Okay, the question I have is, would it be reasonable for the school to <clears throat> develop a lot, <clears throat> another driveway <clears throat> down to, the, to that connecting street so that there would be a loop for the people to use where they could come in, go by the school, and keep going straight to get out and come back to Holcomb or go to Forsyth? Well, so can I say something? My, my child goes there to school, and that this problem has been fixed. So what, I go pick up my son every day now, and, and what they had uh, asked parents not to use Swan, and then I go Ames, and then past your way, and there's actually a person that's out there with the phone checking out your kid. And so all of the traffic is being routed now through that subdivision. Um, and it's, I mean, it's in and out. I don't see any backups now on Holcomb. That's how they're pushing traffic right now. That's how I get to pick mm -hmm. them up. And there's like 50 cars waiting, snaking through the subdivision. Well, that, and where are the, <coughs> where's the, <coughs> where's this holdup that, that, but, it and, was initially, it was really bad, but I think they now the school got, plan and it's it, it it seems like working in the, in the morning is not issue it was just in the afternoon when the buses were coming out and it was a big big snap but i think now vast majority like 99.9 .9 people are using the going through the other way i know the school district pointed out more problems that pick up because it's a little harder than drop off so i don't know i I'm, again i know dana's been talking to them um, and I think uh, the meeting we had with them, they were open to the, the kind of ideas that um, sounds like they've implemented. We talked about that pasture way drop off location and suggested they look at that. I think this, uh, this concept of road connectivity for the um, county's uh, low income housing up there um, is, is, a, is possible. There's several um street you know internal street connections that could happen there and probably would be one with swan avenue as well but i i you know i actually haven't heard i don't know uh cheddar Mayor, what, what you know you've got you've got consultant connections there that maybe you've heard something i haven't really heard much on the development side we haven't seen any land use applications and i don't know internally in my office we ha I haven't heard from any of my staff that have, that have heard about inquiries about development of that property, but often that happens offline through a, a consultant team. So, Jennifer, you might be. I, th I think that what they really wanted was to unload and uh, the, 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 uh, the one that's down by the Steve's uh, market. Okay. And, yeah. and, and get that sold. Uh, both of them are the, the county is losing money and what they would like to do is to convert these either convert or take this yeah. down and build affordable housing and sell sell the units at a much more affordable price oh my god is the current thinking yeah i know they've got two pieces so yeah uh again we haven't seen anything there's been uh I, I would say it's more than a rumor, but there's, you know, I think there's an interest there. I think the county's trying to figure out um, affordable housing in general. And, well, uh, 
I always like to know what is what is the word when they use the word affordable housing. <laughs> where is that number at? Because that number is just like playing dart game blindfolded. Yeah. Well, I don't. You guys are way. I'm way out of my lane here, guys. I don't know. I don't know these housing questions. But um, you keep asking these weird questions. I'm trying it used to, to be affordable to buy a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar house. Now that yeah. house is going for five hundred. Yeah. So you're half a millionaire. <laughs> now is that affordable? It depends on where the where the line's at. It's right. like when they say affordable health care, and I was like, okay, um, what number do you want it to be? <laughs> Affordable is generally less than what I pay. I don't think the any of the builders out there know how to build a 900 to 1200 square foot home anymore. The official Google explanation of affordable housing is paying no more than 30% of its household income on rent or your mortgage. So... Um, well, that's how you qualify for a home loan. Yeah, but 30% of the average wage is uh, $49,000 per household. So 30% of that is 6,000 bucks a year. That's 500 bucks a month. I mean, that's a pretty cheap house. I mean, you can't do that. I don't think you can rent a dumpster from the local sanitation. <laughs> no. <laughs> And convert it into a, uh, a house affordable housing or do those little shipping containers what they're charging for those things henry we need to get control of this is, that, this is not transportation now <laughs> it's affordable transportation that's a bicycle <laughs> all right um construction updates Okay, despite what you might hear on social media, Malal Avenue is on time and on budget, and we're, um, we are got striped despite the rain. We've been able to get our long line striping in. They're working on the, the legends and the cross box now. They've still got uh, some concrete work. And, oh, the other thing that's on social media that's not necessarily true, we're, we're um, you know, they pave over things like manholes and, and uh valve boxes and mark those, but then they come back and they saw cut out and they um, patch around those. So that's what's going on. They're not necessarily digging up problems. They're just digging up planned, uh, you know, utility boxes. Um, the, the, <laughs> we've heard that, you know, the double white, uh, the, that's the buffered bike lane is, you know, that the, the, the I heard today that uh, on social media they thought that was a mistake that we mis mismarked our our fog lines. Um, so we got we got a little bit of training to do there. Um, but anyway, it's on track. I uh, are, we're we were hoping to get signals turned on soon. I hear they're working through some some signal controller issues, but I think they'll get those figured out and. Um, the landscaping is also kind of going pretty slow, but you know, they've got through November to complete that project. So I hope they'll be complete uh, uh, a little sooner than that, but um, it's been a strain like every one of our projects to get everything from concrete to truck drivers to particular products. We've got all of our street lights in, which by the way, we also have a bunch of streetlights at operations that we're looking to get. Uh, there's there's two different styles out there. And uh, so we're converting um, a lot of the, the streetlights that were existing streetlights to, to match the the new streetlights. So well, I think the banner, we're going to put a new uh, cross street banner, kind of thanking everybody for the their patience on that project. Um, just keep in mind, you know, that that was an extensive rehabilitation project for most of that street. Didn't include a lot of the sidewalks on the on the east side of the street. Um, you know, new signalization, a new structure, new water line. Those things uh, took time. Just moving the utilities out of the right of way was a big effort. So um, in a time when uh, contractors are... Uh, continually running over their timelines and running over their their project bids so 
I think we're doing a fabulous job, but I get that it's taken forever. Um, just, but that was our, that was kind of our plan. Uh, we bid it out that way so that we would get good bids and we did get good bids on that project. And so far project overruns have been next to nothing. So, uh, in fact, we might underspend on that project, but, um, so, uh, I anticipate them being done. I don't want to commit to anything less than the end of November. And I think the project web pages, if you watch that, have been well informed as well. So I'm not sure why the social media just seems to go a little haywire on us, but um, but that's kind of that's the real news. So any questions about Malala? I don't want to be done. <laughs> I thought I'd tease you a little bit. I would just say, as long as they don't hire the painting contractor for striping that they did in West Lynn, it would be good. Because are you familiar with what they did over there in Old Town? They painted the parking lanes backwards, thinking this would be oh, yeah. um, you know, more efficient. And it's a cluster mess up. And finally, <laughs> somebody went in there and painted them back the normal way. Yep. Uh, I don't know who. who it's actually safer to, to back in rear. For cyclists and pedestrians, it's safer to have rear and uh, back parking. Yeah. So just well, saying, it's that's safer. Not that good when the person's behind you and then it doesn't give you enough space to, to back up. That's where the problem begins, where everybody's running. Education. Back. Yeah. It, that, was, that was the new city parking plan, was the, for everybody to back into those spaces. Hey, you got people safer that, that way. You got people and they designed it and made it that way. And it didn't work well. Yeah. That's why Ford and other manufacturers make self-parking cars. Because <laughs> people can't back up. They can't even parallel park, most people. I do have a comment on the Mahalo Avenue project. You can go back to that quickly. Um, I just want to provide you know, some feedback from a biking perspective that before this double lines of putting you know, the buffer bike lane, I had motorists tell me to get off the uh, road and I don't belong there and cussing me out. And, you know, yeah, it's for me as a cyclist, it's much safer and less abusive to have those buffer bike lanes. It is lines of paint, but from the motorist perspective, they're actually treating me better. Because uh, over the last year, I've been biking you know, on the construction zone with, you know, sharing with, with cars and they didn't respect me being on the road. And so from that perspective, I do appreciate the lines of paint being there. Yeah, I think it's going to be a lot safer for pedestrians and bicyclists. And that was kind of the intent. Obviously, we're not adding any lanes. We are adding some um, oh, um, medians uh, so that we can kind of control some of the cross street um, turn turning movements, which should make it a safer corridor as well. And um so just just bear with us. We've got we do want to get those signalizations and all those uh, pedestrian crossings kicked on pretty soon. And um, so that, that's hopefully by our next TAC meeting, we'll be much further along. Is it actually wider? It seems like it's wider. Where are you going to be in there? I mean, did you gain any real estate for more sidewalks and all that? It uh, it's. Depends. Some places it's narrower, Tim, but oh. other places it's wider. So, you know, around Claremont, it got really kind of wide over there. That's a little bit narrower um, in front of the, um, oh, the Marquis and the Don Pepe's or Pedro's. Yeah. Um, it's wider there. Um, but there's some other areas where it's, it's a little narrower. Um, but yeah, it's still, it's still pretty much a three lane section, but adding in the the buffered bike lanes um it i think the lanes are actually narrower mm -hmm. so if you looked at the striped lanes or they're, they're narrower now but before they were like you know 16 17 18 feet wide and now they're they're much more channelized sidewalks are definitely wider on that side yeah. um let's see say? The rapid flashing beacon project. I don't have a lot to share with you on that, other than 
we've got three new, well, aside from what's going on on Malala Avenue, there's three going in there. But on, aside from that, we've got one on Lynn Avenue. Uh, if you've been to the new um, Gardner Middle School, there's a nice new sidewalk down William Street, nice wide sidewalk down William Street. So we've um, we conditioned the school to help contribute towards a rapid flashing beacon that will be there near the police department at uh, the intersection of Williams and Lynn Avenue. So that's probably the first one that you'll see go in. They've been working on that. They were, to me, they looked like they were about a week and a half behind schedule because they were supposed to have that done last Friday and uh, they weren't really ready with that. So I, I didn't drive by there this week, but I, my guess is by next Friday, that one will be pretty much ready. And for those of you that live on Holcomb, I'm guessing you've seen some work going in on the two that are going in on Holcomb near one near Swan. And I think the other one's near Hunter. Um, so uh, those are moving forward. Again, that contractor has got through the 28th of December before he's required to be complete. Are these like a flashing beacon, like a, like a yellow flashing light? Yeah, they'll no. there. It'll be like one of those, pedestrian crossings where oh, if you okay. want to cross you can right, push right. the button and it'll light up yeah so there'll be three of those that was like a three hundred eighty thousand dollar contract for three of those by the way so just know that people ask for those pedestrian uh activated crossings um and you know <laughs> we love to put them in we'd love to put more in but um you know, we used to, I think in our TSP, we estimated those at like 35,000 bucks a pop. And um, because you have, uh, a f you may have a fair amount of sidewalk work that goes with them. Um, and any more trying to either, you know, they're on those kind of facilities where if they have to open cut, it's a pretty expensive project. If they have to bore under it, that gets expensive too. So yeah, I mean, I think those are running around $125,000 a piece. So, um, and that's a low bid project, by the way. We're not we're not doing a premium on that. So, uh, I mean, we're not we're not asking for anything more than kind of what, is necessary. what the standard requires. So, so anyway, there's that. Um, Do you have a question? Sorry, I just know Tim. Yes, John, I did have a question, and uh, it is in regard to the entire Malala project. Could you tell me what was a major purpose of it all? I know that turning off on, oh, to go to the highway by Fred Meyer was uh, a big process, but was this supposed to make traffic go faster, conduct, get more people through uh, straight away to the community college? Uh, Tell me what was a major purpose for uh, the Malala project altogether? If you remember uh, when we started the, the kind of the, the pursuit of this project, we got a grant for about $4 million. And that grant covered, um, was really there for enhanced pedestrian and bicycle safety. So, the idea of adding more driver capacity really was not it. In fact, um, I think we're going to lose capacity there because we're not adding lanes. We are adding signals or we are replacing signals. And then we added a signal and then, to, then we added in these three rapid flashing beacons. So there is part of me that says, oh, there's going to be times when it's going to be timed perfectly. And you as a driver will get through there efficiently and you know it won't feel like a less efficient system. There's going to be other times when pedestrians are active, and um, going to, so you're going to see more crossing, and you're going to see more driver delay. But it will be safer. And you, um, there's been you know there's a fair amount of accident history along Malala Avenue, so it'll be safer. It's much more ADA accessible. So if you remember um, trying to, if you've ever crossed Malala at Gaffney and used those. Um, pedestrian push buttons. It was, um, you know, that was an old ODOT facility that really never had ADA accessible corners. And when you hit the PED button, you might have, you might have been able to get, you know, halfway across the street before having a turning vehicle kind of 
conflict with you and want, or, or at least kind of pressure you to get out of the way. So it, it, it's uh, it, one of the reasons why we, if you remember that we converted at Malala and Beaver Creek. So if you're southbound, um, it used to be two through lanes and then you'd quickly pinch into a, into a single lane there in front of the, uh, the, the Marquis Senior Center. Um, we converted that to two left turns to turn folks onto Beaver Creek Road, which is the facility that really is built for more traffic. And uh, quite honestly, I think it's got less pedestrian activity than Malala Avenue does. So we're, you know, Malala has a, a large uh, number of, of uh, residences kind of on the west side of Malala, those neighborhoods back in there. There's, there is some lower income housing back in there. There's definitely a lot of senior centers. So trying to get them across Malala Avenue to go to the shopping centers, whether it be, uh, you know, Oregon City Shopping Center or the um, Fred Myers, uh, that, that was what this was about. Don't forget, it was also falling apart and needed to be completely rebuilt anyway. That too. <laughs> that too. The 2021 pavement maintenance utility fee projects are winding down. Uh, Henry started the kind of the conversation a little bit before this meeting started, which is High Street. Um, we've been uh, we've been in High Street for I don't know how many construction seasons now, but um, on Saturday they finished paving on High Street. They also finished a block of Fifth Street between Center and High, and uh, so pavements essentially done. They've got some striping to do and they've got some punch list work to do, some con some of their concrete work we want them to redo. But um, uh, generally that project is is done. If you live in an area where that happened, uh, that work happened, uh, hopefully we'll be out of your hair here real soon. Um, the, uh, the completion date for that project is October 30th and we think they're on track to be able to do that. Um, that's, that's it. I think Vance is going to talk about the 2021 in-house paving or in-house projects. So Vance, are you still there? I'm here. Okay. So, um, I spoke with, uh, Jason, uh, before the meeting, had him kind of compile a list of the, the larger in-house paving projects that, uh, we did this year. And, and there's a number of them, um, in no particular order. Uh, on Clear Street from Hiram, inclu including the intersection and approximately 150 feet of Frederick Street. That street uh, was pretty much gravel. Uh, we corded out 18 inches, put gravel back, approximately 15 inches of rock uh, in the narrow sections. We made it a more uniform width, and then uh, we paved the street with three inches of asphalt and uh, placed a couple berms <clears throat> to uh, divert rainwater so it wouldn't inundate people's driveways. That job uh, took about 140 tons of asphalt. Another job that uh, we tackled was Warner Parrot. Um, that was rut patching, uh, pretty much the entirety of Warner Parrot. Um, it took the crews a, a, a few days to do that one. Uh, 361 tons of asphalt. Uh, South End Road. Uh, Barker Avenue to Warner Parrot. Again, that was uh, mainly rut patching, and there was a full lane uh, mill and inlay uh, that was done in preparation for the uh, chip seal treatment that was done this year. Uh, that equated to 285 tons of asphalt. Um, Lynn Avenue, Holmes Lane to Glenwood Court, uh, rut patching and a full lane mill and inlay, uh, again, in preparation for the chip seal project that was postponed due to a conflict with the future uh, sewer project. It was 140 tons. Um, even though the uh, chip seal got postponed, it was good for us to get in there and, uh, and get those ruts paved up. Uh, Promenade Street, also some call it Bluff Street uh, at the end of third off of uh, High Street. <laughs> we overlaid Promenade with a, a three inch overlay um, it definitely needed some asphalt work as the existing asphalt was in very poor condition. Um, but a lot of the, the reason to do that job was to uh, alleviate a stormwater issue that affected 
two homes, uh, one in particular on the corner of Third and Bluff. Uh, that paving has been done, as has a shoulder rock in the berm. There's about 140 tons of asphalt. And then finally, a uh, park drive uh, from Lynn to Brighton. Uh, milling and paving was done and needed uh, as needed in preparation for the slurry seal. That was about 80 tons of asphalt. So those large jobs, overlay jobs that we did in-house and the rep paving jobs were in addition to all the pothole patching that we, we normally do and preparation for the uh, slurry seal and uh, chip seal projects. And I went through that kind of fast. What I thought I'd do is uh, uh, I'll, I'll show you guys an email that, that has those streets on it so you can, you can uh, peruse it at your leisure. Is there any questions from anybody? I, I got a question for you, but not about the paving. Okay. How's your, your fall and winter prep coming? It's, it's going good. <laughs> we, uh, uh, I know that the crews have been out um, already testing de-icers, uh, not out putting down de-icer, so let's be very clear about that, but making sure our machinery fires up. We've got adequate amounts of magnesium chloride. We have a good supply of sanding rock. Um, so, you know, it's getting that time of year, especially come November, we're going to start putting de-icers in the back of trucks and, and uh, you know, We'll see how it goes. A lot of times it's mid-November where we'll take one of our dump trucks and outfit it with a plow and a sander and chain it up and just have it ready to go. Uh, same with the de-icer setup. Our stormwater division, um, uh, you know, they've already been, we've had some good rains already this year. Uh, so they've done their typical, you know, checking our main drains, the problem areas, things like that. The leaves are really starting to fall good now. So um, we recently had a meeting uh, where with uh, our stormwater division, transportation, uh, where we team up. We have both sweepers out for a couple of months, uh, trying to keep on top of leaves. Uh, we have one sweeper uh, that's being serviced right now. So we're looking at hitting the ground running with both sweepers, uh, you know, later on this week or first part of next week to try to keep on top of the leaves, which is always a challenge. Thank you. You bet. I uh, don't know who was first. Ray, go ahead. Tim was first. Tim can go first. Okay, Tim. Uh, John, you might have already uh, said this earlier uh, in the program. Uh, when are is the city planning on fully moving into the new warehouse facility up on top of the hill? We should be open on the uh, 15th of November. And are you going to move your entire project from Center Street all the way up there? It'll include, um, yeah, so staff from engineering. Uh, we'll have staff from our GIS and IT up there. All advances group, uh, which is, you know, basically operations and fleet. Um, we'll also have the uh, facilities folks that are in the parks department and then or yeah, I guess it's the parks department. They manage facility folks. So there's two of them that'll be up there and, and room for another in the future. And then uh, parks maintenance will be up there. So I've lost track again, but it seems like there's like 70 people that are gonna be up there. And um, yeah, so we're, our big move is we start, we start actually moving files and things um, the 5th of November and then another run on the 12th. So we'll be shutting down pretty much business on the 12th and uh, have IT is going to be working through the weekend and getting computers up and ready for business on the 15th. Um, what's going to happen with the old facility? Well, um, <laughs> we've got no, we still got a lot of needs that don't that aren't housed at uh, First Street. So the commission hasn't made a policy decision on that yet. I think there's some that would like to see us move out, but <clears throat> we don't have wash rack. We don't have bin storage. We don't have uh, well, we do have a wash rack, but we don't have a uh, de what we call a decant facility where we can dump vector waste and let it dry out before we haul it to the landfill so we don't have to pay a lot for it. Um, we don't have enough parking really for um, the staff and the equipment needs up there. 
we probably we have enough for um, you know employee parking and daily drivers, but things like plows and patch trucks, those those things that aren't daily drivers, we still got to figure out what to do with those. And so we've got First Street, we've got Mountain View, and we've got Center Street, and trying to figure out how to utilize all those with parks is kind of our is, is the question, but um, that's still yet to be. Kind of decided. And if I if I might add um, some other things we do not have programmed or room for it at Fir Street is our sanding rock that I just mentioned, our magnesium chloride, and uh, a bulk storage. You know, think three quarter minus cold patch, gabion rock, and a spoils bin. Um, it, as truly good as the Fir Street site is, um, it is limited on space for things like that. So those are uh, some of the other things that, that are currently here at Center Street. And uh, frankly, hopefully uh, they can uh, stay here. All right, Ray, go ahead. Yeah. I'd like to learn more about the uh, de-icing process because during the ice storm in February, I saw that only the roads were de-iced and the sidewalks were full of ice. Like I tried to walk on the the sidewalks and the bike lanes are also iced over. Mm -hmm. And so is there a process for de-icing sidewalks and bike lanes or is it only for roads? It's only for roads, Ray, um, for a couple of reasons. One, even though it, in the wintertime, if it's icy and snowy, there probably aren't many bicyclists, maybe just you, because you're a good bicyclist right now. <laughs> so, uh, and not many people on the sidewalk, but the way our spray bars work, um, we just we just can't be spraying off of the travel lane. Um, think park cars. We wouldn't want to slather those with the magnesium chloride, mailboxes, garbage cans, citizens, things like that. Um, I believe our municipal code, John, correct me if I'm wrong, but sidewalks, uh, it, it is uh, the responsibility of the uh, property owner to keep those free to the best of their ability from snow and ice. So, so that's the that's the story on the magnesium chloride application. So, if I understand correctly, I need to talk to the property owners for like the, the uh, commercial properties that had uh, you know iced over sidewalks and mm -hmm. they make my power was out for a week during the ice storm and I had to walk around. It just was not safe to get places, and so so I need to contact property owners to ask them about the ice in their sidewalks. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. This would be a good time to also say you don't use salt on concrete because it does nasty things to the concrete. Now, let's be very clear, Henry. We're not using just salt. We're using magnesium chloride because yeah. I, I don't want to have the concrete. I, I, was, I was thinking of the property owners clearing the side, public sidewalks. That's right. Bobby, you I really, uh, um, yeah. Henry, I appreciate that because... Um, we saw it a few winters ago on Main Street, and you can still see where they used uh, inappropriate product on their sidewalks down there, and it's showing signs of failure. Yeah, so, it, yeah. basically, a lot of people, lot of people it, want to throw rock salt, and a lot of you know home stores will sell you salt rock, and it's mm -hmm. it's pretty effective at cutting through the ice, but it's uh, it's it's um, a costly mistake once it gets to your sidewalk. Yeah, it, it causes the concrete to spall and, and come apart. Yeah. All right. Uh, Bobby had your hand up. Yes, I was wondering uh, <clears throat> the end of the Oregon Trail Park Place sign toppers. Yes. That we discussed before. I gave guidance to, to get the ones that you had and still in stock replace the most faded ones up there. Have you made any progress on that? No, I don't believe we have, Bob. Um, that, that will occur this fall and throughout the winter. We're going to use that as fill-in work. Um, all those paving jobs I mentioned has is, is kept the entire crew busy all summer, but uh, it is definitely on Jason's radar. He knows about it, and uh, we'll get the remaining signs that we have that are adequate 
Uh, some are used, but they're still in better shape than some that are out there in the area. Uh, as I mentioned to you, um, you know, we did survey all those signs and uh, there are some intersections that the signs are non-existent, whether they never got installed or they've been pulled down over the years. And a lot of the signs are, are of pretty poor quality as, as you've noted. Yeah, okay, no pressure. I was just asked that at the uh, Park Place meeting last night. So you bet. I, told him I'd, I checked it with you. And the second thing, maybe this is more for John, is once you get the first street facility up and running, how about having a TAC meeting up there so we could have a grand tour? Yeah, I'd, lo I'd love to. We, we've kind of got to figure out open house and tours and, you know, how to, you know, get folks in that building because we're quite proud of it. Um, Vance and I have been pulling our hair out trying to, you know, get through what's really a remodeling project, right? I mean, that, that a lot of that existing building has been reused. So like to, we've got a nice big conference room up there. I'm not quite sure how we will do the uh, meeting recording piece, but um, maybe it's just a, a, you know, we do TAC at six. Maybe we do a four o'clock tour and give folks some dinner and have a chance to get back to your home computers at six o'clock or something. Um, that's an option. Assuming you guys are up for that. It's a pretty neat building. I think it's got some uniqueness to it, but um, it's going to really be something that we're going to benefit from for many, many years. I'll, I'll bet you that. Any beer left over? You know what, Bob, they showed me some, uh, some hams cans uh, that were kind of stuck behind some uh, plywood that they put up against the warehouse walls. And I don't know, there was like a half rack of those sitting there. Uh, <laughs> so we could, yeah. we could probably serve you one if you really wanted a, <laughs> a beer. The, uh, I'll bet that community, that, that, conference room up there is probably wired for sound and audio we might be able to have our meetings up there yeah we could um it's not yeah i mean we could we haven't really we do have a lot of electronics in there for that kind of thing some of it was value engineered to be installed later but, uh, <laughs> um that would be Stay would within budget. To, would the public be able to be uh, accommodated in that, like the like the are at City Hall? You know, we yeah. want to have our meetings open. So, yeah, not really, Bob. It doesn't um, it doesn't lend itself to that very well because you know it's just not designed for you know community access after hours. We'd have to staff it, and we'd have to figure out how to kind of cordon off certain parts hallways. When you see the building, you'll get it, but um, it, it's kind of an engineering wonder, I think, in a lot of ways, because, you know, we took a, an open warehouse and turned it into a two-story Class A office space that's, you know, Class 4 earthquake proof. So it's a great building, but it's definitely got, um, you know, some uniqueness to it that really doesn't lend itself very well to, you know, say a neighborhood meeting or something like that. But we can, we could, we've got a beautiful conference room and uh, it's a, I think it holds like 18 people and um, <clears throat> we'll, we could, you know, we could definitely have a, a group, you know, assuming we were COVID free kind of a scenario, but, and uh, we've also got a nice big staff room, but it's kind of at the back of the building and deep inside, kind of deep behind the, the office cubicles and so forth. If you saw Vance's office, it's got an echo to it. He's it's just it's just uh, pretty massive. I think he's got room to park his motorcycle in there or something. So <laughs> yeah, a, a small one, but rest assured, guys, it's not as big as John's office. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all I had uh, for the public works report. <laughs> well, in that case, with is there any questions or any new stuff to bring up? I have one. Uh, how close are we to having our meetings back in the city hall again? Any any projections on that? Um, 
Well, we're still, I mean, as far as kind of staff have heard, we're Tony's been kind of pushing things out till December. So through the end of the year, I think, um, and the commission's meeting, having kind of these combination in person and online meetings. And uh, so I know, Bob, I haven't heard of, you know, open forum meetings uh, yet. And the reason I asked is because some of the other committees and whatnot are starting to have those in the old city hall again. I know that the CIC is now having our meetings. What's the same thing? So. I didn't, yeah, I guess, are those, are they fully, I mean, how many people are they letting in those meetings, Bob? They haven't um, given us any restrictions. Hmm. We, we try to maintain, of course, the distance. And if all the CIC members uh, attended one meeting, which hardly ever happens, but it would probably be mm -hmm. uh, close to 18 or 20 people. So, you know, getting them up that far apart is somewhat difficult, but the current meetings have been oh, probably <clears throat> six to eight people in the room itself and then several others via Zoom. But it is available for people that want to attend in person. Yeah, I don't know. Kim, could you make a note to, let's just check in on that. I haven't really yeah. asked or looked at the rules on that. Um, I asked Katie when she, well, when she was still here uh, a couple months ago and she at that point said that it was, you know, nothing had been changed and she had had no direction from Tony that we were going to go back in person. So, yeah, I'll, I'll circle back around and see. Okay. I missed the 530 pizza. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. Truth comes out. All right. And Henry? Not hearing anything more. I was just going to say um, to Vance and John, thank you for getting those street lights on uh, Redlands Road. Uh, I can see the turn lane now. Good. Now we can just need to figure out how to slow the traffic <laughs> coming around the corner. <laughs> that would be a good spot. But Maybe we should uh, put a school bus stop there and that will slow the traffic. We'll put one of those crossing things there so the, what, to that building across the street there. <laughs> we did. We also, Tim, got your... Uh, your destination signs on Washington uh, cleared up a little bit. I don't. You missed the last meeting, I think, or when we yeah. gave the update on that. Yeah. But um, that's that. That should be a little, little cleaner. I don't remember all the changes, but Dana and Vance and Jason worked together to get that. There was several things that were set back quite a ways from the roadway, and uh, they moved them out into the planter strip and made sure trees are trimmed and so forth. Cool. I'll, uh, I'm going to go to Home Depot tomorrow, so I'll, I'll take a peek and see. That. But it's, it's interesting how you guys determine how wide there's always people doing new turns right there at 213 in Redlands. I never figured it out. I just like, why is everybody turning around here? So that's good. I, I did have one thing, but only on a very long-term basis. And that is after living here as long as I have, I come to realize we have lots of streets that begin and end in various weird, strange places for no appropriate logical reason. And would it be possible to get the street signs put up to show where things like Lynn Avenue begins and Lynn Avenue ends and Leland begins and Fifth Street ends and Seventh Street, where Seventh Street turns into Malawa and sort of demarcate on the ground where all these various weird connections are. Hmm. It'd be interesting, Henry. I did, you know, you mentioned on the ground. I don't know that that uh, thermoplastic markings on the pavement really would would do much. And if you signed it to demark as you're going down the road, <coughs> 7th Street ends and Malala starts, 
I don't know how you would face the sign so a motorist would catch that. The signs almost would have to be at the side of the road that you oh, really yeah. can't see unless you turn your head. It, the only, the only, the only thing that I had thought came up with was something like, like a normal street sign off on the corner or something that's, you know, basically had some sort of an arrangement that said Lynn Avenue that way, 7th Avenue that way, you know, the old, the old arrow marker boards from what, 70 or 80, 90 years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, Henry, when you were a city engineer, how come you let that happen, that these roads? Well, <laughs> I had other things on my plate. <laughs> That's a good point, Henry. I think it's worthy of further discussion. <laughs> Touche, Vance. <laughs> but, but anyway, I, I understand it being a very long-term thing and not something that can be done right away. But every once in a while, you know, I, I get somebody stopping in front of the house and saying, Where's Lynn Avenue? It's about five blocks that way, you know, just keep going straight. And so that's that's the upshot of all that. And then I thought about the Mount Pleasant intersection and how to all the, the various five roads or whatever it is at all end there and how to put up signs for that one. The roundabout will cure that. Why don't we put the roundabout in? We could do that anytime. <laughs> All right, Henry, are we good? We're good. Anybody have anything else? Yeah. Hey. I pronounce this meeting over at 10 minutes to 8.